All right. How's everybody doing today on uh, the Open Stack Summit Boston? Good? Good. Uh, before we start, um, I wanted to get a, a show of hands in the room. Who works for a small or a medium-sized organization that's interested in pursuing OpenStack uh, for production workloads inside of your respective organization? Awesome. So hopefully we can fill in some of that stuff for you today in this presentation. The title of it is Free My Organization to Pursue Cloud Native Infrastructure. But before we go there, just a little bit about us. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Black. I work for East Carolina University, and I am a systems analyst slash programmer. Um, what I really specialize in is virtualization, so whether that be traditional virtualization or public or private cloud virtualization. I've had about seven years experience in IT with the last year and a half really focusing on public and private cloud. Um, I have a really heavy background in VMware, Linux, and OpenStack. Um, I'm, at work, I am known as Go to Lunch Steve because I never leave. Um, some people get there before me and leave before I do. Um, so it's kind of interesting that I really have dedicated uh, the last few years to really pursuing open source technology and OpenStack. Great. And hey, guys, uh, David Kane. I work for Red Hat. I'm a senior solutions architect in the Global Partners and Alliances organization. So I work with Red Hat's key OEM and service provider partners on building solutions, specifically cloud solutions. I've spent about the past 14 years working in IT uh, with a cloud infrastructure focus. So a lot of what I say I've taken from, uh, from the school of hard knocks, I would say. A little fun fact about me. Uh, I really love vintage machinery. I like to restore old cars, uh, which we'll talk about that in the presentation some more, uh, old hand tools, anything older than 40 years, just like the quality and everything associated with that. And if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my handle is up there. So quickly, the agenda that I want to run through today with, with everyone for this, this session, uh, I want to introduce uh, East Carolina University, talk a little bit about uh, the, the school, its mission statement, how many students it has, as well as its business and technology challenges. Um, we'll take you, Steve will take you through that, and we'll lead up to kind of a decision-making process that their organization went through uh, to actually say, yes, we're going to adopt OpenStack in our, in our respective environment. Uh, I'll take you through what are solutions specifically for OpenStack and why you should care and what these are, a little bit of a definition. And then Steve and myself will take you jointly through proof points and results since the deployment of OpenStack at East Carolina University. Some advice for you, this track is evaluating OpenStack, so we do have some advice for you and your respective journeys, those that raise their hand, as to how to begin uh, this journey to cloud native infrastructure, as well as a little taste as to uh, some of the next steps uh, in ECU's deployment, what's some of the things that they're looking at next? All right, everyone. So I want to give you a little bit of background on East Carolina University. Uh, we are the third or fourth largest uh, four-year university in North Carolina. We have around 30,000 students and around uh, 5,800 faculty and staff. Um, specifically, the department I work for is called Information Technology and Computing Services. And what we do is we provide uh, a lot of the public-facing services uh, that the university offers, uh, as well as not only hosting those, but we also do a lot of uh, development on those platforms as well. Um, the slide needs to be updated a little bit. Uh, that says 150 employees. It's really around 200 now. Um, and my team has about five people on it. So let me talk a little bit about the business challenges of why we went and pursued OpenStack. Um, specifically, uh, we have cost and budget. Uh, most problems in the industry are time and money, right? Um, so the way that the university works is we have certain budgets that we really can't go over. And a lot of our budgets reflect around fixed assets, right? So uh, we own and host most of our stuff. and. Um, that leads us to uh, time, right? So as an organization, we have time constraints on certain projects and things. Um, so a lot of uh, our time was spent automating and orchestrating a lot of things we do with OpenStack, including other technologies. Um, and we are also a siloed uh, organization. Anybody in here in a siloed organization? All right, you guys know my pain, right? Um, <laughs> 
So um, uh, one of our biggest concerns uh, was customer service, right? Uh, being in a siloed uh, organization, we have challenges of interacting with uh, a bunch of people to provide a very complex set of services, right? Uh, so we provide services to like 12 different colleges and we have bunches of platforms, right? So we're not just like a single vendor shop. We have everything you can think of. So when our customers demand something, uh, we either have to be specialized in it and it might take us a little bit longer to get some of those processes started. Um, and another big part is because we do provide those services to so many people and we have budgets for every little thing. So uh, as uh, ITCS, part of the organization, we may have a budget, but if we provide services to say um, a college within the university or de another department within the university, they have budgets to deal with as well, right? So it's uh, really difficult to manage your fixed asset resources uh, along with providing service to those customers. Um, also, as a university, we have to worry about uh, data privacy and compliance. Um, so we do have HIPAA data, uh, PCI compliance we have to worry about, and student data as well. So we, we don't like to interact uh, student data with like production data and stuff like that. So we really have to be aware in our environment um, how to separate these things and manage them efficiently. So when we were starting our journey, we were looking at a few different um, platforms. Uh, one of them being public cloud. And I think we got a quote for some of our Windows servers to go in uh, to a private, uh, public cloud, and we were looking at around $50,000 a month. That is really expensive, especially when you have a budget, right? And that wasn't like all of our main infrastructure either. That was just kind of a little subset. And that can be very difficult for our organization because uh, those, those budgets happen, you know, uh, in a fiscal year, so if we had a higher demand for resources, we wouldn't be able to meet that, right? Uh, if our customer just wanted like 20 more of something, well, we quoted you on this, we can't you know, expand uh, that good in a public cloud because we just don't have the budget, right? Uh, so we looked at externally managed hosted services, and what that really means is a service may be a platform. So one of our biggest platforms is uh, our ERP, our Enterprise Resource Planning Platform. It's called Banner. If you've ever been to a university, you've probably seen Banner before. And what that does is that does everything from uh, student registration to paying for books, paying for classes, um, looking up tax forms, transcripts. I mean, this thing hosts a bunch of resources, right? So there's a bunch of services that make up the service. And if we were to host this on, uh, say, like a, a public provider, um, we've had this for over 10 years now, and we've done a lot of customizations and uh, programming and development behind the scenes to add new features to it. Um, and we were afraid that my mic not work, might not work. Um, so we were afraid that uh, a lot of these features that we had wouldn't be uh, compatible or supported if we went with a vendor-provided solution, right? So we're, we're always... Uh, um, kind of hesitant to go uh, to an externally hosted solution because we can't actually control that, right? Um, then we had the option to stick with uh, traditional virtualization technologies. We use a wide variety, uh, KVM, Rev, uh, RevM, uh, VMware. I mean, we, we have a lot of technologies that we use, right? And so as a, as a price point uh, to manage these technologies, it was getting really slow, right? So if you go and manage one thing at a time, it's kind of slow, but if you can improve resources for a, a bigger set of uh, uh, customers, then it makes things a little bit uh, smoother in the future, especially when you roll over hardware or uh, make upgrades, right? Um, and something else that we wanted to pursue was microservices and containerization. Um, and a lot of our platforms, you know, 10 plus years old, we can't really containerize everything overnight, right? So you want to uh, host on an environment which um, really empowers you to be able to do your containerization or microservices. Um, and also, um, when we were looking at solutions, we thought, wow, private cloud really seems like a solution that would be really good for us um, because it's scalable and flexible. Uh, so when we were looking at private clouds, we looked at a bunch of different vendors. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them out there, right? Uh, we're a really big Red Hat shop. Uh, we're very familiar with a lot of the software uh, and the open source projects. Um, so when we were looking for a solution, uh, we really had a focus in mind to, um, hey, can we really find hardware and software that fit together really well? 
um, and incorporate all these things into um, you know, our, our future services. So before we talk a little bit about what ECU eventually went with, I, I want to talk a little bit more about how customers view OpenStack solutions. So that was in the agenda slide. What, what are these and why should you care? And I've made a, an XY graph right here with risk on the, on the X axis and return on investment in the Y axis here. And I'm a car guy, so do it yourself or type thing. I mentioned I like vintage machinery. I have a 51 year old car that I've been restoring over the past four or five years. And I have a, an intake manifold from one manufacturer, an engine from a different manufacturer, suspension system from yet another. So I've essentially put together something myself and I support it. Um, one can make a similar parallel in building or starting an OpenStack journey right there. Certainly a, a lot of major players uh, that have accurate or ac adequate staffing and resources to have a do-it-yourself type of attitude where you put all of these individual parts and components together. Yes, you can build something, but maybe there's a better way for organizations that don't have the staffing or the resources or the ability to pay for consulting agreements for stuff like that. So. I want to introduce reference architectures, you know, moving a little bit more to the right on the scale there of lower risk and more of a return on investment. And that's kind of an overloaded term right there. So when you say reference architectures, back to the car analogy right there, I'll make the analogy that uh, a reference architecture is a playbook. It has components built into it um, from vendors, hardware and software vendors, but it does not accurately uh, reflect maybe step-by-step -step directions or actual validation of that, uh, that software stack on that hardware stack with a joint roadmap between those entities writing that, that uh, reference architecture. So one of the things that I want to introduce as a follow-on to that, maybe a reference architecture plus plus, is a flexible solution. So a flexible solution encompassing everything that I just described, but very much more prescriptive guidance, automation that comprises that, and purpose-built configurations that have been known to work, known to scale, and include uh, companies with deep partnerships and deep engineering relationships and collaboration over a multifaceted stage. Now, going back to what I said about do it yourself, you know, like I said, I'm a car guy. I love to customize things. I'm not saying that you can't customize your deployments, but what we found, and you know, humbling myself working with great engineering teams, uh, you know, in, in companies like this or even customer deployments, I found that customization up to the nth most scale is is kind of a, a, an effect of uh, a penalization in scale. And you know, one of the things that I would say, you know, specifically for a flexible solution or your specific journey, is start at a known boundary. You know. Take the customizations that are unique and inherent to your individual organizations, but start at a boundary where you know everything works and you can get up and start it, and you can actually be productive um, with that. Hold on. Go so, back to slide. so I want to add to that a little bit. Um, for all the people who raised your hands, um, who of you actually went out and built your own OpenStack and it worked perfectly and you were able to scale and you know it just works beautifully? Yeah, that's what I thought, right? So uh, when we were looking for this, uh, this flexible solution, we said, look, we don't have a lot of time and money to spend into researching and developing uh, this solution to be able uh, to be flexible. Uh, so one of our concerns was, how do you actually uh, have a solution that you know will scale properly, right? So. Uh, our, with our solution that we purchased, um, I've seen other customers actually be able to scale that, so I kind of trusted that. Um, also, you, you have to put a lot of trust into people who are providing those services to set you up with a flexible solution, right? So if you buy a car, you buy it to travel, right? And, and Dave was talking about he likes to build cars and uh, uh, change out all the parts and things. Well, me as a customer, what am I going to do to it? Well, I'm going to change out the tires. I'm going to, you know, add uh, spinners on the side. I'm going to change out my seats, right? I'm going to, I'm going to add features on top of this f flexible solution, and I need that to be supported, right, for compatibility. So when we were looking for the solution, uh, not only did we buy it because it was proven to scale and work, but because we wanted to add to it, and that was a very good price point for us. So as to the solution that ECU deployed at their site, I'm introducing right now the Dell EMC Ready Bundle for Red Hat OpenStack platform. 
And this is technology comprising of Red Hat, Red Hat OpenStack platform, Red Hat Ceph storage, as well as uh, systems and servers from Dell EMC, specifically the PowerEdge R630 and the PowerEdge R730 XD. Um, those are available as well as the FX2 modular blade-based architecture today. And that includes uh, the open networking Dell EMC uh, switches. And the core architecture is a 10 node starter kit deployment with 10 gigabit networking, everything highly available, um, starting at a half rack of systems. Uh, the, the team itself, I'll introduce a slide here in a minute, but really the ideal use cases for this are infrastructure as a service, containers as a service, um, scale out software defined storage, uh, but tests and development workloads, but also production workloads. So really this is an ideal starter case to really uh, the technology stack to start an OpenStack journey. And what does that look like from a logical architecture perspective? So I mentioned everything in the infrastructure layer at the bottom um, of this picture here, but the software layer on top of that, um, you know, deployed by Red Hat OpenStack platform director, that's uh, Red Hat's management and orchestration tool to do that. That deploys Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, arguably the uh, most successful, longest uh, Linux distribution for the enterprise there, 17 years and counting, as well as Red Hat Ceph storage for the, the uh, block storage, arguably one of uh, the most popular storage solutions for OpenStack. Um, but, you know, I mentioned before the reference architectures. This, this is where a solution like this is different. We also have a, cl a cloud orchestration layer on top of that. Uh, the, team, the team jointly, Dell MC and Red Hat, provide uh, prescribed and validated deployment guides to have Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform, that's our containers as a service project there, comprised in the reference architectures, um, as well as Red Hat Cloud Forms. So these guys validate um, uh, very, very well our, our joint engineering um, work that we do together. Been doing this for about three and a half years right now. Um, and we include things on the side. I have certified extensions. I mentioned these, um, you know, having validation of Red Hat Cloud Forms and OpenShift on there, as well as professional services engagements involved with this. So for those organizations that may not have the staffing or the capacity to deploy this, you know, Dell, EMC, and Red Hat go on to the customer site and actually work with the customer, uh, get them up to speed with getting this deployed you know, rather quickly, I, I heard a, a, a statistic at the keynote at uh, Red Hat Summit where, where Steve was on stage saying that they took their deployment from three weeks down to three. Um, so that's, that's also a portion of both the professional services and this automated deployment tooling, which uh, Dell EMC and Red Hat have announced as Jetpack. So this is tooling that accompanies the reference architecture that really helps uh, stand up and deploy things in a validated and repeated manner um, very, very quickly, and then they're turned over to the customer after the engagement there. So I can stand up here and spouse on stage all day about the, the benefits of this, but really what you guys care about, S Steve, how did, this, how did this help your organization? So Dave, Dave is showcasing all the benefits of a flexible solution and uh, specifically that solution. When ECU went to uh, look at this solution, like I said before, we weren't looking at just implementing OpenStack, right? We were wanting to improve uh, performance, uh, time to providing services for customers as well. Um, so what we were looking at is integrating a lot of tools additional to this. Um, so when we looked uh, and we communicated with Red Hat, like uh, what all tools can we integrate with the solution, right? So we're looking at, um, Ansible, Puppet, we're looking at uh, Red Hat Satellite Server, and we really wanted to integrate everything and maybe even have a single pane of glass in the future for self-service, right? So this solution has really led itself uh, for us to be able to uh, pursue that. Um, so I want to talk a bit, little bit about our current standings. Um, at the beginning of that project I mentioned earlier, uh, we had around 10 services spread across 20 traditional VMs that we wanted to migrate over. Um, so since then, we have added additional 10 services to that. A lot of that time savings was spent making cloud images or like virtual appliances, you may hear them called. Um, so we're able to deploy those really fast. Now we are at about 100 instances. So we have two data centers, two separate clouds. Um, so 50 instances per site, right? And we also have OpenShift on OpenStack now, and that happened about two or three weeks ago. So we're just starting out with that and starting to containerize uh, some of our services. Um, so comparatively to the initial deployment of uh, the, the Dell solution, we met at about 70% capacity 
right? So our first three months of using uh, the platform, we, we hit about 30%. Uh, and we were starting to develop more and more, and our customer demands got really high, and we started to need to scale out, right? Uh, but I talked about earlier, we had those budgets, right? So we were able to purchase some, some RAM and some more storage, and, and we were able to grow, but now we need to add more compute nodes, right? Um, so at our current capacity, we are at 50% capacity. Um, when I get back uh, in a few days, they plan on me adding some more compute nodes, so I gotta do that when I get home. <laughs> um, but what are the real results of having used the technology, right? So I talked earlier about our capital expenses. We were able to reduce our capital expenses by tenfold. Um, that goes for hardware, uh, software licensing, um, and some of the other costs associated with that. And also we have operational expenses, which were a lot of time and management, right? And we were able to reduce those by about eightfold. That's pretty impressive. If you go to your boss and say, hey, I can turn $5 million into a $500,000 expense. Who wants to do that, right? That's like guaranteed job right there. Um, also, along with that, notice that we've adopted a lot more automation and orchestration, right? And that's really helped our time. So I wanted to provide a few little statistics on that. Um, so if you look at the graph on the right, we had time to build VMs. So this is uh, kind of a comparison on the way we were traditionally doing things and the way that we're doing things now. Um, so you can see uh, our biggest bar over there is server assessment. So when ECU uh, provides a, a service to a customer, we have to make sure we meet all those compliances and that we know exactly what the customer wants and then we have to uh, get certain uh, things from uh, some of our silos like storage or network or, or firewall requests to be able to do these things, right? And then the actual build time uh, was around four days and that's kind of slow. Um, now that we've been able to incorporate all these things and kind of streamline uh, some of those procedures, we've been able to hand off a VM in about half a business day. So what that really means for me and my team is I can launch an instance in about 10 minutes and be production ready. So what I mean by that is actually working in production. So 10, 15 minutes to launch something in production, that's pretty impressive. However, we can improve that even more by doing self-service, right? So we're, we're starting uh, to allow some of our uh, internal customers to do that, and that has gone uh, fairly well so far. Uh, I talked earlier about having to get stakeholders on board, right? And the best way to do that is to give them a button. People love buttons. Click, 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 more, more, right? So our customer service has gone way up. Our customers uh, love that we're able to do all these things a lot quicker, as well as resource management. And what I mean by that is I was really referring to management of the infrastructure, right? So if you're doing infrastructure as a service compared to traditional technologies, um, your resource management becomes easy because you just set up quotas for your tenants, right? And um, that makes it really easy. So when you go into projects, you know, hey, I have this much resources left, I can easily gauge uh, how much my customers are gonna need, um, and if they ask for more, I just change some numbers, right? And it happens, and then I just have to request things later on. Um, so ha having stated uh, that we've adopted new technology and that we've had somewhat of success, I would say, um, I have a few words of wisdom that I would like to impart. Uh, the first part is the easiest way to adopt new technology is convince management that they're gonna save a lot of money. I talked about the uh, tenfold. Uh, if you can bring that to your boss and say, hey look, this guy did it, we can do it too, um, that, that's a pretty good argument. So if you get management on board, uh, change generally starts with one person having an idea, right? But one person can't change everything. So you really need to onboard uh, people in the organization. So that could be um, in stakeholders, your own teammates saying, hey guys, let's try this and then go to uh, the other silos. If you're in a silo like I am, um, go to the other teams and say, hey look, let's come together, let's collaborate, and uh, let's see what we can make happen. So that becomes a little bit easier. So some other advice from an operational perspective. Yes, you have you know, all of this awesome new cloud capabilities right here, but having a way to monitor that so you can accurately reflect how much capacity you're using. You know, at, at Red Hat, I'm apt to recommend to totally open source things right there. So Fluent D for log management, or um, you know, for the actual systems itself, 
gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but have a daemon on your system itself so you can monitor how much CPU it's using, how much memory, how much disk space, how much latency right there, and have those, those metrics captured in a portal like in a graphite Grafana type instance. So when it comes time to ask your boss for more capacity right there, you've got empirical data and you understand and you have a viewpoint into your entire cloud right there. And also chargeback. Um, you know, depending on the organization there, some some folks have internal chargeback capabilities right there. Um, have have that uh, you know nailed down even before you do your your cloud deployment there, because you know every organization is different how they charge back to get money for resources that they deploy for their customers right there. So just take that into account from an operational perspective. Um, also, your key stakeholders, your customers, your clients that use that infrastructure itself. You know, we talk about digital transformation, and it's such an overused term, but really digital transformation of the technology stack itself, there's also a human element involved in that. Your organizations have to transform as well and start thinking about different ways to either write your applications or, or service your IT, like what we're talking about right now. Push these folks inside of your organization. Show them the realms of possibilities that emerge uh, whenever you have you know, agile development practices. Um, certainly containerization, that's an extremely hot topic here. But you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of organizations have so much traditional code written for them, it takes time. And so break things down in a stepwise process and don't try to boil the ocean, uh, at least at the onset there. Um, as well as having specific roadmaps for whenever you do implement a solution like this in your respective organization. As Steve mentioned, you, know, you, you onboard these specific folks, but what we've found that's really helpful is having workshops or having training uh, and enablement sessions. So not only show up at your, at your coworker's desk, look at all the cool stuff that I can do with this technology, but you know, onboard them, create a participative community inside of your organization, onboard them and get them enabled so it's not just you as the stakeholder, you've got an army of people with you to help you make this transition a little bit easier. So what about at the future at, at ECU, Steve? What are you looking at next? So we have a lot of plans uh, with OpenStack and in general. Um, specifically with OpenStack, we're looking at um, upgrading the load balancer uh, as a service V2 um, or F5 integration. Uh, I talked about earlier we wanted to incorporate self-service and having that integration would make it a lot easier for our internal customers. Um, also with OpenShift, uh, we may look at Manila with CFFS or uh, having Gluster run in OpenShift. That's also in tech preview. Uh, so we, we don't want to go too far into the bleeding edge, but we want to look into it right because um, there, there are um, some challenges you may face, but knowing that the community will update in about six months, some of your challenges may be solved. Uh, so always look to the future. Uh, we also are looking into Ironic, uh, deploying um, instances to bare metal, right? Um, so that would be very useful for us if we wanted to launch a database on OpenStack. Um, that would be very useful because databases do not run very well in VMs, especially if you have large databases or clustered databases. Um, also, we are um, in the pursuit of cloud forms as our single pane of glass. That's manage IQ in the upstream for self-service. Um, if we can adopt this and get it running great internally, uh, we would like to maybe possibly um, extend that out to a few more customers. Uh, specifically, um, in general, we are looking at providing services uh, maybe to a, a wider range of customers, uh, possibly students, faculty, and staff with uh, some other options available. Um, and we are also looking at hybrid cloud bursting for our DR strategies as well. Uh, coming from a traditional standpoint, we do a lot of backups and a lot of DR as well uh, for everything we offer. Um, as part of uh, cloud bursting, not only does that apply to uh, private cloud, but also to public cloud as well, right? So we have a true hybrid approach. We're, we're not going to just stop using other technologies. We want to use all the technologies together, right? Um, and as part of that, as part of DR, we also are looking uh, into hosting things at another data center as well to really spread our footprint uh, and be more highly available. So we have a lot of things going on at the college right now. Those are just a few of them, um, but I thought I'd give you guys a little uh, insight onto what we plan on doing in the future. Um, as some closing statements, some of the most important things that I wanted to recommend 
were to buy in to your organizational stakeholders before you go and deploy this and, and say, okay, it's here, now use it, right? You really have to convince people that what you're gonna try to do is going to benefit them, right? So uh, I talked about uh, onboarding, and one of the best ways to do that is uh, choosing a good solution for you. Um, so for us, private cloud was a very good solution, even though we use uh, a lot more than that. Um, but flexible solutions are a very good option, especially if you are budget constrained um, and need to have something right away that you don't have time to uh, put a lot of effort into. So as I mentioned, for digital transformation, OpenStack is uh, you know, pretty much the de facto infrastructure as a service nowadays to, to build private clouds. Um, consider using a flexible solution, like I mentioned, to help accelerate your cloud journey there. You know, the, the, the notions of you know, doing it yourself while attractive, you know, not all organizations are, are massive retailers or massive telcos that can really embark on putting all these pieces and parts together. So choose something from a known baseline. And yes, customization is great. These are, these are uh, great platforms that's, that service as a kickstart uh, to, to helping you start your cloud uh, journey and transformation. Yep, so I'd just like to close and say that investing in cloud native infrastructure has allowed us to show very great gains. We've saved a lot of money, uh, made our customers happy, and we plan to do more so in, in the future. Specifically, we were in a reactive state where we had to meet demands all the time, just reacting to demands, but now we're able to proactively look at other technologies and look towards the future. And really, if you can start your organization to look towards the future instead of just reacting to your customers, um, it'll be really helpful and, and it will help you grow. So a few resources uh, that I wanted to post out here. Um, the first URL, the, the title of this track is, is Evaluating OpenStack. Um, this URL is a, is a portal that um, uh, Red Hat, Dell EMC, and Intel share uh, that can give you a uh, POC in your respective environments there. You just have to fill out a form, look at some resources that are on there, and someone will contact you if you're interested. If you don't like salespeople, if you just want to see the, the reference architecture, what we talked about here to, to make up your own mind and do your own self-research for now, uh, the URL is, is the second one there. And it's about a 30-page document right there, very, very descriptive and prescriptive. And the rest of the documents associated with this solution are up there and and the same website there that you could look at too, the extensions and everything else that I mentioned there. So with that, we have a good amount of time for question and answers. Um, if you will, uh, step up to the microphone so that, because this is being recorded. Uh, so before you went with the uh, solution uh, that included, <coughs> sorry, some custom packaging and, and support from, um, uh, Red Hat, did you have a chance to experiment with any of these, this on your own, like different, uh, and I say I'm comparing, let's say, because Ubuntu has a version of OpenStack, so does Red Hat, then you have CentOS, which I guess it would be the same flavor, except you'd be providing your own support. Yeah, so it's really easy to go out and test OpenStack and these other open source technologies because they are open source. So if I didn't want to go with Red Hat or Dell, I could potentially go out there and deploy any form of OpenStack or even an up, upstream project, right? Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, we, we did look at other technologies as well. Um, and the reason was is because we uh, mainly had a site license for a lot of licensing. It was really accessible to us. Um, but I can go out there and deploy uh, Ubuntu OpenStack on my laptop in about five minutes, right? So uh, we did have the opportunity to test other things, and we did. Um, but since we had kind of already paid for it, uh, that's what we decided to go with. Hey, you mentioned uh, planning for self-service with cloud forms. Wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what sort of services you might offer to students versus faculty and staff, what sort of services or apps or environments might be suitable for, to offer self-service. Yeah, so that's a dream right now, right? So we're, that, that's a very challenging um, approach. Um, so I'll answer that in two parts. Um, 
we're looking at self-service uh, for our internal production use, um, and that's going to be our main use case to uh, um, different environments well, right? Not just OpenStack, public and private cloud, just uh, pretty much any technology, uh, but also because we have OpenShift integrating uh, containers. You can request a container or infrastructure if you really want it. Um, uh, we want to provide what the customers right, uh, want, right? We don't want to just say, here it is, use it. So CloudForms is a good uh, gateway to, to tying in uh, a lot of those features. Um, and separately, um, to answer the question about students, faculty, and staff, really they have demands for a lot of things, right? And we're just starting to assess uh, what they may want, so we're looking into a lot of different options. Um, and I can't really answer that fully right now because we don't really know. That would be a very possible solution. He said uh, labs for classrooms. Yes, that would be possible. How did your uh, backup solution change between the, you know, before going to OpenStack and now with, how did, could you talk about that process? Yeah. So. Um, specifically, our backup process, um, we had uh, snapshotting capabilities in a traditional uh, virtualization environment, as well as uh, backing up uh, bare metal servers as well. And so a lot of the services that we migrated over did become virtualized, right? And um, so I talked earlier about having cloud images uh, or um, uh, virtual appliances, right? Um, so one of our backup strategies is if it's a virtual appliance and you've automated it, um, do you really need to fully back up everything? Well, yes, we have multiple copies, different places, right? So we have two data centers. Of course, we have uh, a DR um, backup uh, strategy as well, so we have it stored there uh, as well. And if we want to do snapshots, we can do that within OpenStack. Or if we want to do a more traditional customer wants a more traditional backup strategy, we can also back up those VMs fully as well. How did you, how did you manage the adaptation um, phase of this? Was, were there any resistance by system administrators, faculty? Um, were there any, a second part to the question is self-service. Mm -hmm. um, once you implement self-service, what type of uh, adaptation phase are you going to use for that as well, too? Right. So um, I'll answer the second part first uh, because of the question previous. Um, so to adapt to self-service model, uh, we're really looking at hosting internally first. Uh, so that'll be kind of more of our, our POC type of environment where we onboard uh, some of our main customers and let them use it and see if they like it. Um, as far as, as the second portion, I can't really answer that for uh, faculty and students. Um, that's kind of above my pay grade. Uh, however, I would like to say that uh, the uh, adoption of OpenStack and getting customers to use those, we had a very specific project that we were looking on um, uh, implementing, right? So we, we, we needed to find this solution for a specific product, uh, project. Uh, and what we were able to do is we did it piece by piece. Um, so we might have had two or three customers at the beginning and said, hey, if we sit here, uh, hold your hand through the process, try to help you streamline it um, and make these um, cloud images is, is what I've been doing um, and really help them automate their deployment because if they can't containerize what they want uh, and really what most customers want to do is containerize things uh, so it's easy for them so they don't have to deploy uh, instances or VMs. But in cases they can't, if you are able to help them do that, um, that helps the process. And as far as resistance from administrators or anything like that, um, no, because everyone should be leaning to the future, right? You should always be striving to find better solutions or improving performance. So if you get resistance, it might be more of a, a conflict of what solution you want to use. So. Um, that, that would be up to that specific person, and you, you can't force people to do what they don't want to do, right? So you have to really cater to the people who do want to try something new or uh, will easily adopt things. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'll be sticking around afterwards right outside if you have any specific questions you want to ask. Thank yep. you. Thanks, folks.